Joining us on the line is Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He's a professor of medicine at Stanford University, research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research, senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and at the Stanford Freeman Spoli Institute. And he also directs the Stanford Center on Demography of Health and Aging. He has a piece in the Wall Street Journal over the last couple of days talking about the actual death rates from COVID-19. Dr. Jay, thanks so much for joining the show. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. So let's talk about your piece. The initial estimates of the death rate on COVID-19 were extraordinarily high. We heard from the World Health Organization, the same organization that screwed this thing up by believing China when they said there was no human-to-human transmission, say that the death rate on COVID-19 was 3 to 4%, which, of course, is like Black Plague-type stuff. I mean, the, it's, yeah. it's the sort of thing where you start thinking, okay, tens of millions of people are going to die, especially when combined with the infection rate, which apparently is extraordinarily high. You've examined the statistics, and what you say is that the death rate is actually exorbitantly low, or at least exorbitantly low based on the, the original estimates. How do you come to that conclusion? So, Ben, let me, let me explain the, the, a little bit about the scientific uncertainty here, because I think it's really important to understand. So the, the 3% number and a lot of those high numbers come from something called a case fatality rate. The case fatality rate has a numerator and a denominator. Numerator is the number of people who die from COVID. That's a hard number, very, you know, very easy to see and measure. The denominator should be the number of people who have been exposed to COVID, got the disease. Um, the, the, pro- the problem is that when you measure the number of people who've got the disease, you, the test people use, and that everyone's used up to now, being like for scientific reasons, there hasn't been a good test, uh, an alternate test, is a, is a, is a test that RNA content of your, of, of, to see if the, the, that you actually have the virus actively in you. But what if you get better? What if you get the, the COVID and you get better? Well, then the virus is gone and that test would be negative. So the denominator, and, and we also use these tests in a way to focus on people who have the disease, you know, are really, really sick to help guide clinical therapy or, you know, to think, I mean, it's completely reasonably. But if you put those things together, you end up with a denominator that focuses on people who have the virus and ignores the people who don't, who got the virus and now have antibodies to it and are probably immune. Um, so what you really want for the death rate is in the denominator, both of those populations, people who actively have the virus plus people who have the virus and are, are clear, cleared of it. Um, so that's why I think that it's likely that that 3, 3.4% number of the World Health Organization now is put, put out is, is, a, is probably too high. Um, the, the central key piece of missing scientific information is, this, is what's something called the seroprevalence, the, the proportion of the population that have antibodies to the virus. If we had that number, we could know the true death rate, and we could know how extensively the the virus has spread. It's already spread very, very extensively. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, and and you've mentioned also that that when it comes to the number of people measured, there's also just the the lack of testing generally means that there are tons of people who are walking around who may in fact have it and are asymptomatic, but have not shown up for a test. So we're, we're missing a couple of numbers. We're missing the people who have recovered and have the antibodies, and we're also missing the people who are walking around symptom free and transmitting this thing because those people aren't getting tested at all in most places. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, so there's, there's both are absolutely sources of error in the, in the in the denominator of that number. We have to have that denominator for rational policy because there's two possibilities in with the, with the data I've seen, and they they produce very radically different, like correct optimal policy response. So on on the one side, you have a, a, a disease that's incredibly deadly, but only a very, you know relatively few people have it. Then you have a, an incredible long shutdown to avoid making so that it extends to everybody else. That might be reasonable. On the other hand, you have a, a disease that's very very widespread and as deadly like the flu, or maybe less than the flu. Um, it, of course, the problem is that not you, there's no vaccine, so you can't prevent lots of people from getting it. But it, it, but on the other hand, a, a shutdown in that situation is probably l- less likely to, to be the right policy response. That you want targeted things where people are vulnerable. You hold them, you know, you keep, you quarantine them, or you provide them support. You make sure the hospital systems don't get overwhelmed. It's a very different policy response. Um, the key number that decides between those two scenarios is the zero problems in the population. What we what we desperately need right now is testing for of what that number is and a, a population level study of the, of antibody testing the, to find out what the zero problem is to decide between those two scenarios. And so, so my colleagues so are trying to work Jay, on this. One well, one of the things oh, that, that happened today, and I don't know if you saw this, is that the the UK actually announced that they no longer consider COVID nineteen to be a high consequence infectious disease, specifically because. 
they are seeing the death rate is significantly lower than they thought it was. So in your estimate, when we talk about what the actual death rate is based on sort of the incomplete data that we have, are we talking about a disease that is about as deadly as the flu? Is it less deadly than the flu? Is it multiple times more deadly than the flu? What do you think is the range of possibilities here? I mean, I, I think I, I, my hypothesis is it's less deadly than the flu. In order, I don't know for that for a fact. It's a hypothesis. And because I don't know the number, I don't know the serum. Once I know the serum prevalence, I can answer that question with a lot of certainty. Um, the people that say that it's 3.4%, they also don't know that number. And they're acting on, uh, you know, people say based on their expertise that, that I know it's one number or the other. I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that because they don't know that no scientific study has done and looked at that number. Um, so the question is, how do we respond now? Um, I, 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 my, I, based on what I've, the numbers that I've looked at and based on my analysis, I believe that it's very likely a widespread disease and, and much less deadly than the, and, and less, de- not much less, some, and somewhat less deadly than the flu on average, although obviously it's, it's killing, killing people, lots of people in stressing hospital systems around the world. So it's nothing to take lightly. Um, so the, I, but I, I think the key, the key way to convince people about that is let's do the science. Let's actually conduct the population zero surveillance. Uh, and for that, we're going to need to get rid of lots of hurdles. So like the, the FDA only the last couple of weeks, or I think last week, uh, maybe two, a week and a half ago, approved the first antibody test for use in the United States. We need to expand our capacity of antibody tests very, very rapidly and apply them in intelligent ways. Uh, the very first you should be to let scientists who want to measure the serum prevalence, let us do it. Well, with all of this said, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, professor of medicine at Stanford University, let, let's say that your hypothesis is correct and the death rate is significantly lower than certainly has been estimated and maybe lower than the flu. So what would that look like in terms of policy? So the, the sort of going... No, uh, the going suggestion has been that we needed a mass lockdown in the absence of data so that we could determine exactly what the rates are and so that we didn't overwhelm our healthcare system because obviously everybody's seen the flattening the curve chart at this point and the curve being flattened beneath what our healthcare system can actually tolerate would be would be necessary at this point. We've seen no estimates from the federal or state governments as to how many beds, ICU beds, how many ventilators would be necessary where we feel secure in letting buddies sort of out of isolation at this point, except for extraordinarily vulnerable populations. Do, number one, do you think that the mass lockdown was the proper policy in the absence of data? Number two, given that the mass lockdown has already taken place, how exactly would you approach alleviation of that lockdown? What steps would you take uh, in, the, in, in the near future in order to get people back to work if it turns out that your hypothesis is correct, that the death rate is significantly lower than expected? I mean, I, uh, the, to answer that first question, I, I guess I don't really have too much time for recriminations at this point. Um, I do think that we should, going forward, think much more carefully about how, how we make these decisions. Because I think to, to some extent, uh, fear led to, to decisions that have led to the shutdown. Uh, I think the, the shutdown on the other side will have no more consequences. I mean, I'm looking at uh, uh, unemployment rates that are just on a you know, Great Depression level. Um, and I don't. I think that the mortality effects of that as well. So uh, I think one of the key things I would like to see reformed is to is to systematically appreciate the uh, not not just the visible consequences of like you know people dying of COVID. It's visible. People reasonably want to stop do something about that. But also the the, the invisible things that happen later as a result of policy. Because I, I, I believe there's likely to be excess deaths substantial numbers of them among the poor, among the elderly, among lots of vulnerable populations as a result of the, the depression that I think we're about to hit. About to hit. Um, but again, that's, that's for, I think, a, for a later time. Um, right now, the key, the key question is what's the serum prevalence? And, and I think once we know that, then we can, then we can start to relieve the shutdown. If, the, if it is as high as I believe it's likely to be, um, we can start to relieve the shutdown. We can also use the testing as a way to see if you can, uh, you can go back to work uh, my my old uh, my old professor uh, who uh, wrote, a, wrote a really nice piece about this, uh, Alan Garber. He, what he basically argues is that look, we can use zero zero pro, uh, you know, antibody testing. Say, if you're antibody positive, you're probably immune. Go back to work. You have, there's no risk of you from COVID. No risk of spreading it. Go to, and and so we can end the shutdown right there, uh, intelligently by systematically letting people go back to work who who were, who were not. Mm-hmm. You know, spreading the disease in any way, shape, or form, and are immune from the uh, immune to it already. Um, so, I think uh, those kinds of ideas would be really, really useful going going forward. So we can sort of 
balance the epidemiology and the, and the economics in the right way. Because um, right now, the policy of a complete shutdown is going to have consequences on, on the other side. Uh, and people have characterized it as dollars versus people, you know, deaths, but that's not really right. It's deaths on both sides. Uh, you know, if you, sh- if you have an economic depression, people are going to die. Uh, so I think uh, I think that's the right way to start thinking about this. Let's 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 do recriminations later. Right now, let's focus on getting the right number we need, which is the serum problem, and they're starting to use the antibody testing in a way that intelligently allows us intelligently allows us to expand uh, to to relieve the shutdown, get our economy going again. We're speaking with Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, professor of medicine at Stanford University. So uh, I know that we don't want to do recriminations here, Dr. Jay, but when you, when we talk about the the lockdown and and the the entire economy shutdown. One of the suggestions was made by the, the Imperial College study that suggested that half a million people were going to die in the UK. They've now estimated that down to twenty thousand or less in the UK over the course of you know three days. The people who are in charge of the study basically suggested the reason for that that is number one the death rate being lower, but number two that the lockdown is actually effective at preventing this. If you let people out of the lockdown, it's not going to be 20,000, maybe it's 100,000. There's a study that came out from University of Washington today suggesting that the total number of deaths in the United States over the next four months could be 80,000. I'm not sure what death rates they're applying in that study. I've been trying to figure that out all day long here. Do you think that the lockdown and, and people staying home has been effective in at least reducing the transmission? How many excess deaths have actually been prevented, and I'm not looking for you know a hard number, but but like yeah, a lot, I, I, some, you, a few. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't give you a hard number on this because it's difficult, right? But um, I think the key thing there is uh, that you can see the uncertainty in practice uh, right right in front of you. The, the argument for the shutdown essentially is to not overwhelm healthcare systems, uh, like as in Italy, as, as what's happened in Italy. Uh, that's actually not unreasonable. I mean, it depends on what uh, it depends on the capacity of the healthcare system to deal with large numbers of people who need ventilators and ICU beds and things like that. Um, so I think uh, that, that I, it's hard for me to say, like, comment directly. I think I have paid very careful attention to the Imperial College studies study, uh, and, and that I, I saw just this morning. But uh, Neil Ferguson, the PI for that study, just just basically changed his mind. It sounded like, but I have to look more carefully. I, I think there the that that that's. I mean, there you see people putting numbers in the, the, the zero prevalence. Essentially, they've assumed a zero prevalence and death rate number initially that led to this massive, massive shutdown uh, policy. But that number it isn't justified by a, a, an actual study of, a po- of the population. They, they, they guess that number. Um, I mean, I think we, we we scientists need to be much more careful about uh, about and more humble. I think about uh, you know the confidence with which we say let's do this when we when we don't actually know a number. We should be, we should say we don't know that number, uh, or or reflect the uncertainty in our in our in, or confidence in our our statements um, much more more effectively than we typically do. And Dr. J, final question for you. Let's let's assume that we actually do get these tests in place that we start running. Uh, all of these zero prevalence tests that that pre- zero prevalence, by the way, just to check my definition of this to make sure I'm getting this right, that would be checking the prevalence of the of the antibodies in people's blood, basically. Exactly, once those ben, tests exactly. yeah. uh, once the once those tests are correct, then how soon do you think this lets up? How soon could we could we be looking at getting out of uh, getting uh, out of I want, home jail I want here? these tests yesterday. I want these tests yesterday. I want them done yesterday. I want the number immediately. I, I, and we have uh, studies that I'm, I'm working on with some of my colleagues to get uh, in Santa Clara Valley and and, uh, and L.A. County to get to get uh, Sierra Palm and Silas County. But we need a nationwide study and we need support for a nationwide study immediately. But the key, the, the two key things that are missing right now is we need a large number of antibody tests and we need uh, some funding source to pay for, pay for that test. And then we can get those, we can get that running. The whole, I mean, the scientific community around the, the folks I'm talking talk, talk with, they want these numbers also. So this is not something that's controversial. I don't think it's partisan. I just think it's, we just need, we need the number. Um, and I, I'm hoping we'll know it in, in uh, two weeks time at the latest. Well, really uh, amazing, amazing stuff and, and interesting and vital stuff here from Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, professor of medicine at Stanford. Really appreciate your time, sir. And uh, thanks so much for your hard work on this topic. Oh, yeah. Thank you, man. It was a real pleasure. Take care. I hope you enjoyed that clip from The Ben Shapiro Show. If you did, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you stay up to date on all of our future content.